Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon. We're so glad you're here today. I'm Linda Winter and I work with the Wacom education team. And we're here today for, for what I think is going to be an exciting and inspiring webinar. We've titled it, We've Got Chemistry, the Science of Remote Learning. Um, and we're joined today by Beth Tuminello from Calhoun High School in Long Island, New York. Wacom technology, as many of you know, we have 35 years of digital pen input technology. And, and from the beginning, we've been so excited to see what creativity can really bring to the world. And now, thanks to educators across the curriculum, like Beth and her colleagues, now we can see how much is really possible um, using this technology in, in both the K-12 and higher ed, higher ed environment. So let me tell you a little bit about our logistics today, and we'll move the slide forward. Yeah, thank you. We're gonna go for about an hour. We'll save time at the end, about 10 minutes for questions and answers. And please feel free to submit your questions and your thoughts. Use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit your questions rather than the chat or hand raising. It helps, it helps Beth and it helps, it helps me and later some other panelists who will join us. Be sure we can see your questions and answer them. Uh, as I said, we'll go for about an hour today. And so we may not quite get to every single question. We're gonna do our best to answer every single one and Beth is great at that. Um, and we have some Wacom folks on the, uh, in the background ready to answer questions as well. If we don't get them answered, we will get answers out to you in, in follow-up communications. We're gonna record the session today and a YouTube link, you'll receive a YouTube link after this session. And we hope if you wanna watch it again, that's great. Um, and we hope you'll share it with your colleagues so they can see um, all, of, all of the great ideas Beth will share with us today. So let me tell you about our, our webinar today. Um, as we, as we at Wacom were looking around social media channels, we began to discover that science, and in a lot of cases, math teachers in middle and high schools uh, were beginning to use digital pen and tablet technologies. Uh, we reached out to some of them, and, and these educators, um, true to form, have been just so generous with their ideas and suggestions about how to engage students in remote, in blended, and also in on-premise class environments, uh, using a, a really a range of resources from videos and simulations to other multimedia resources, all to bring science, to make science education as impactful, as engaging and effective um, as we can in, in remote, blended, hybrid, and on-prem, uh, on-prem environments. So now I want to introduce you to our presenter today. Uh, Beth Tuminello, as I said, is from Calhoun High School in Long Island, New York. She's been using technology in her classroom when she's been teaching live. Um, and you'll hear her talk about that, her use of the flipped classroom model. Teaching chemistry from home has, has really just sparked a renewed interest in in how we use technology um, and resources that are available. Beth, Beth is, a, is, a great, is a great, not only classroom teacher, but great in terms of sharing her ideas with colleagues. So Beth, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you take it away and we will watch for questions. So thank you all and we're so glad you're here with us today. Hi, my name is Beth Tuminello. Uh, as Linda said, I am a chemistry teacher. I teach chemistry and AP chemistry at a public high school on Long Island in New York. And um, just this past spring with having everything that happened with having to go at least partially remote, um, actually, well, fully remote, um, I learned and renewed interest in a lot of technology things that I'm just really looking forward to sharing with all of you today. Um, a couple of notes. Um, you might see me look down a little bit. Sometimes I might be taking notes for myself, but I'm also just getting my bearings. I am going to be screenwriting a little bit using my Wacom Intuos. Um, I did get this about four years ago, and it has been really, really valuable for me to be able to write on the screen. And I'll take you through a couple of different ways that I've done that and a couple of ways that I plan to do that in the fall. 
my particular school district will be going to a hybrid model starting when we start school back, which is um, the, the second week of September for me. And um, I'll have half my class each day and then the half of the class that's not in school will be remote for that day. So there are a couple of things that I will be using to make up for that. Um, they all will be remote one day a week for the first few weeks. And so some of these techniques can be used while you're fully remote also. Um, just a note, I do have a toolbar down here. This is a portion of my ink to go toolbar. And I'll just show you. So ink to go is the program that I use for the writing on the screen. You can see right now I'm a pen. I can change that pen to be thinner if I want to. If I want to write a little bit more precisely. And I can also change the pen color to um, just make some different emphasis based on um, you know, different things we like to write on the board in different colors. So I will also, you'll see I'll change the color there. Um, when I'm in ink to go, sometimes you might see, I might make a little mistake of this icon is still a pen. I can't do anything else but write. So I will have to go back and become a cursor. This ink to go toolbar is really helpful to me. Even if a, an app has an on board, screenwriting app. I usually default to this anyway, just because I'm so used to it. It's really super easy to pick up and I'll be talking about it a little bit later. Um, you'll also see this little toolbar pop up. This is just the Google Slides toolbar. And um, I have a couple of videos to share with you as well. So let's just move along to the next slide. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is join me on the interactive Jamboard. And when we go to the interactive Jamboard, if you just go to the chat, you'll see the link. It is a two line link. So if you could just copy and paste that and what would be really helpful for you, I think, is if whatever browser you're in, you go to file new window and then um, do this side by side so that you don't have to go back and forth to the different, um, the different tabs. If you do a new window, this will work. And when you get there, it should look something like this. And I see that a bunch of you have already joined. That's great. I already have 15 people there, 17. As everybody is joining there, I'm just going to take a little pause um, and just wait for you to join there. I'm really excited. We already have about 20 people there. You'll notice that it does show up as anonymous. If you're in a different um, organization with a different Gmail ending, your name will not pop up there. If everybody was in your school, if you had your students joining and they all have the same dot, um, dot org, dot whatever dot org at the end, you will be able to see names. So what I'd like for you to do, if you look at this toolbar over on the side here, I'd like for you to focus on this one right here. Some of you already figuring it out, that's awesome. And just click on that and make me a sticky note with your name and your location. If you don't wanna put your full name, that's fine. Remember this is public and this will be um, viewed on YouTube as public. So if you wanna go and um, you know, just put your, your first name and your location, that would, be, that would be great. So hello, Ashley and Kaylee and Judy and Sonia and Ken and Christine and Elisa and Sasha. Holy cow, there's so many of you. Um, so I do just wanna, wanna play with this a little bit and show you. If you look at the top corner of your sticky notes, you can see on my view that every time someone is editing something, an icon comes up there and I can see who owns that edit, which is great. Um, so what I would like for everybody to do, yes, you can, uh, that's the next thing I was going to do, Sasha, is if you look on your sticky note, which I'll make mine, if you look on your sticky note, and I clicked on the wrong one, sorry, if you look on your sticky note, and you put it up on the screen, you'll notice that they all kind of get on top of each other there. But we can drag the corners to make them bigger or smaller. We can do the top left corner to rotate if we want to. And we can also edit, duplicate. We, I can actually make mine um, stay in the front so that mine is always the one that's on top here. Um, and you can see that there's a tremendous amount of edit potential if everybody has that edit 
um, that edit allowance, that editability. And what I'm going to ask you to do class is just pause for a second and just listen to what I'm saying. So stop editing your post-its for a second. And um, the first thing that you would need to do before making a document like this live for your students is talk about some digital oops, citizenship. You want to make sure that you talk to your students about um, what the rules are. And so the rules are that when the teacher tells you to do something with the Jamboard, that is when you make a change. When the teacher says, everybody stop and no longer edit your Jamboard, everybody has to listen. So you will have to set forth some rules here. Now, the other part of it is, and this is a little bit of a scary piece, is that when you go to the share, you, the way that I gave it so that, the way that I made it so that you could all do this and interact with me, is that I gave everyone access to edit. Now, it's a little scary as a teacher, okay? So when I am going to do this, I will change my access in my share menu, okay, in my share menu to everybody who has the link has the ability to edit. But when the lesson is done, or even in the middle of the lesson, if I say, oh no, you know what, people are way too distracted, I can go onto my phone and I can go into my Google Documents app and I can turn off the edit ability. I can turn off the access by changing the, um, the share settings. So just keep that in mind that you do want to make sure that you have the app open on your other device as well if you're concerned about your students kind of taking this and running with it. So if I go and I take my, my share, I'm just gonna show you for a second, now try to edit it. I just changed it so that you only have viewer access, which means that now I can take control of the board and make sure that if it's getting out of control or out of hand, or if it's getting to a point where I wanna stop and move on to something else, I now changed it so that you do not have edit access. I'm gonna give it back to you, don't worry. And all yeah. I'm doing- Hold on just a second. Some folks are getting a message that says there's too many people viewing this file, try again later. Okay. And. Um, and, and we know this works. Yes, so, so I'm, I'll just, just move on. Sample. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, so I'm just gonna change it all to viewer for everybody. Okay. So we now only have the ability to view it and I'm just going to ask you to please now close that window. There were some other things that we were gonna do with this, but since everybody can't participate, just close that window that you had open and I'll just do it through screen share, okay? So now, if you'll just watch it with me on my screen, um, what's really, another thing that's really great about Jamboard is that you can, this is my sample one that I had set up so that we could use it otherwise. Um, you can set it up and just open it up at certain times. Now I'll assume um, that our classes are usually under 30 students, so you won't run into that same situation where too many people are viewing it at once. Um, so you will have the situation where, you know, for me, I'm going to be using this when my half of my class is home. So when 15 students are home, let's say, or 14 students are home and 14 students are in the classroom, only the students at home will be using this. And what I will be asking them to do at certain points is say, hey, everybody right now, turn your sticky note to blue. And once everybody's sticky note is blue, I will know that they have all heard that piece of information and they've heard that piece of instruction. Now, as I begin to teach, keep your Jamboard open. And if you feel as though I'm going too quickly and you'd like for me to slow down, change your sticky note to yellow. And by doing that, I can have my Jamboard open on another device sitting at my desk, 
the, the device would be sitting at my desk while I'm teaching and I can have a visual, okay, well, you know, uh, three people or four people have changed to yellow. I don't have access to their nonverbal cues because they're not sitting right in front of me. So as I see more people changing their Jamboard post-its to yellow, I can get that cue that I need to slow down. That's just one way that I thought about using it. Um, and we're gonna move along from here. So anybody who didn't get to join, um, I apologize that you didn't get to join, that you didn't get to do it live, but um, you know, I please know that, that this works. I have tried it with, with groups of students and it does work. Now, another thing is if you wanna give the students viewer access, you can use the Jamboard just as a place to write and you can use the pen tools over here and there are different pens to choose from and different backgrounds to choose from. So if you wanna change it to that background that has the grid or the background that looks like graph paper, and then I can use either my mouse to try to write or I can use a trackpad or even easier, I can use my, my Wacom tablet and this pen on the Wacom tablet will work and I can say, Hello everyone. And maybe I want to go ahead and start to answer a problem. So I can say, everybody look at this file, open it up and listen to me. And I don't then have to worry about the screen sharing so much. I can just write on here. And because it is a live document, if I give them viewer access, they can see my writing as if I was sharing my screen and all they have to do, like the way that you copy and pasted that link into your bar there, into the search bar, that's all they would have to do. And if I want to write a chemistry problem on the board, I can do that and I can take them through, let's say a balancing equations while they're watching the Jamboard on their end instead of watching it with a screen share. Just another neat way to do it. And I'm gonna move along from the Jamboard because of the fact that um, we couldn't all get on there. Um, something that you'll get in the slide deck that's going to be shared at the end is just another example of the way that I can use this. And again, if I give my students edit access, instead of changing the post-it color, perhaps they want to drag a beaker under green, yellow, or red, depending on whether they need me to um, you know, they, I can continue going at the same pace, or they need me to slow down, or they need me to stop. And if I start to see the students bringing things over to the red side, I'll know without those nonverbal cues, because they won't physically be in my room, I can then determine, wow, I really need to stop and take some questions here. So that was just some ideas about Google Jamboard. I'm just going to go back to the, back to the slide deck there and go back to present. And so um, in the slide deck, there are also some videos about this, but I just did it live, so I'm just going to move on. The next thing that I do wanna to talk to you about, a lot of people, when I talk to them about presenting on Zoom or presenting in Google Classroom or even making videos, is they say, I can't do that. I'm not polished enough, I'm too nervous about that. And what you should know is that this whole process is not about being perfect. This is about being you. Your students want to communicate with you as their teacher. And it's great, there is a place for sharing videos that other teachers have posted, but we get a lot more connection with the students when these videos are videos that hear our voice and sometimes hear, uh, see our face and I apologize, I just advanced instead of clicking on here. But what I did want to show you on here was talking about not being perfect. Um, while I was making this video, my daughter was in the room and she was getting into the middle of my video with her orange. Um, she's 12, so you know she should know better, but we were having fun with it. And this video was a video of me showing I had gotten dry ice from a food delivery and I just wanted to share with my students. Normally I would have said, hey, you know what? Maybe I wanna do a demo with this in class if it was still 
not all sub, uh, you know, not all, all gone into gas. Um, but what I decided because I was from home and I knew that I wasn't going to see my students is I just made a quick video about it. Making these videos doesn't have to be a perfect process. We can make them and we can share and we can not sound the best or not look the best and our students will appreciate it because of the fact that it's a connection with us. Um, another thing that I think is really important is finding the science around us. For anybody who is using NGSS or an NGSS derivative, which New York is going to be adopting a, an NGSS derivative, we need to start in order to make our students scientifically literate, we want them to be science citizens, we need to start showing them all the phenomena that happen around them. And, you know, I see that naturally as a science teacher, it's what I do. It's one of the reasons why I became a science educator is because of my love of science. In order to instill that into my students as well, I try to find the science around me. And while I may not be able to do that in person with them as much this year. I've just been going around normally and taking videos. The dry ice put into water was a great one. Um, something I did the other day, I was boiling pasta and I decided to take a video of the boiling water to talk about the fact that everyone thinks they're seeing the steam above the water, but we as science educators know we're really actually seeing the condensation. The steam is dangerous because it's not able to be seen, but what you see above is that condensation above the pot. And I just made a quick video about that that I'll share with my students once we start. So try to find the science around you and share that with your students to try and um, help them become scientifically literate citizens and just really try to be human with it all. So the next thing while we're talking about videos, I do have a YouTube channel and um, on my YouTube channel, um, the way that I set it up here, and I'm in the wrong place, I so apologize, I'm sorry. Um, when the way that my channel is set up is that I have at the top is a landing spot because it's the summer and I've been making some videos for teachers for help with teacher technology. I do have that video at the top. Normally it'll be my most recent chemistry video that my students need to watch. Um, so I do have a whole teacher tech section here, but I also have two sections for my Regents chemistry. For those of you not in New York, Regents is just our state chemistry. I have playlists for all the chapters for the students to be able to find here. Um, I also have playlists for when we get to our midterms and our regents, our state exams, where they can go through and see all of these. And you can see I've been using Bitmoji for years on here since before it was a, a cool trend here. And I also have my AP chemistry topic videos down here. So I do not have a website that I use. I use Google Classroom with my students. And so they can also look here to find my videos and my videos are Mrs. T Chem Talk. Um, so I do have that at the top of my board in front of my classroom as well so that they know all they need to do to search if they didn't find it in Google Classroom, all they need to search is Mrs. T Chem Talk and then the name of the topic. So perhaps they want Mrs. T Chem Talk and they wanna look up the video about the reference tables, they can just put that into Google. And I do try to make sure that it's not just one place for them to find it, that they also know, because we want them to be internet savvy, although most of them are more savvy than we are. Um, I do make sure that they do know what keywords to search for so that they can find my public YouTube channel. So we're done there. And now we're going to go uh, to talk about some ways that besides sharing the, the science phenomena, that we can also make sure that our students benefit from labs and lab activities, even though they won't be in the classroom necessarily to do the labs. And one of the labs that I was able to videotape a couple of years ago was the lab for bleach and food coloring. And for AP chemistry, there is a, it is a rate order lab. 
and it is about the order of the reaction where the bleach reacts with the food coloring um, to see whether it's first order or second order or zero order or something like that. And one of the things that I noticed is that my students weren't connecting the lab to the phenomenon, which again is a very NGSS thing to say, but it's um, just the way that we need to teach science. We need for them to see what's happening and link that to the chemistry. And so I videotaped um, on time-lapse just this beaker of bleach and food coloring. It also is something, you know, where we have students possibly with any, with respiratory ailments or issues like that, bleach isn't something good for them to necessarily be around and breathing. So that from a lab safety standpoint, when you're working in large quantities, that works as well to just videotape whatever phenomenon you are trying to show them. And then I also, a few years ago, put that lab, I was able to screen record the lab itself. And this was made with a vernier um, Spectrovis and Logger Pro from Vernier. And the, you can see I also was using Ink2Go. This down here is my Ink2Go toolbar that was the full toolbar that shows up on the page there. And what I normally would have done with this video, I would have used it as a preliminary video. I would have said to my students, okay, on Monday or Tuesday, we are doing this lab with the Vernier Spectroviz, and we are going to be doing the bleach and food, food coloring lab. Please watch the videos that have no audio, okay? Please watch them this weekend so that you can figure out and see exactly what you expect to see in the lab. And they can watch through everything that's going to happen. They can also watch it on a, um, on a faster time scale and see it there. I also did go through and videotape, uh, screen record, I should say, using the um, Ink2Go program and I believe that's Excel up there. Um, but I just put the data up there and I screen recorded. And what I would do now if I was using this is I would use my Wacom Intos, okay, and my Ink2Go program and I can write on the screen and I can say, okay, see here I'm highlighting the data and I'm graphing it because we wanna make sure that as we graph this data, we are looking for our straight line. And when we find our straight line, we know that that means that we have found the order. And I can go through and I can write on the screen from home or from school using ink tools in Ink2Go, Smart notebook, um, people use, some people use screen, screencastify. I mean, the, link, the list goes on. Loom, screencast-o-matic. I mean, people have IPVO. There's so many different of these screen writing apps and whichever one you use, you certainly can use it with the mouse, but it makes it so much easier to have this little tablet to write on it. And you can see I'm facing you and I'm looking at the screen and I'm very easily able to manipulate the pen and write on the screen at the same time. So something else that I use um, in my classroom, and this was set up prior to the school closures in the spring, but I do use my uh, Welcome into us and this program, this Ink to Go program and PowerPoint. I will take a PowerPoint that's already set up from class, so there's no reinventing the wheel. And I will just take the problems on that PowerPoint and I will screen record my working through those problems. So some of the time I will keep the pre printed writing on the screen, but other times I will go through and I will talk over as the writing is coming on the screen. And this is so much more natural than just presenting the typed part of a PowerPoint because it allows your students to see the work as it happens. Okay, so as the work is happening, you can be writing. 
I'm sorry, you can be speaking over it. And just like we would speak and write on the board at the same time, which is how we have learned to pace our lessons, we can speak and write on the screen at the same time. And that handwritten work is what my students have told me is what they want. They want to see the handwriting. Some people might say like, oh, but my handwriting, it's atrocious. But if your handwriting is atrocious, atrocious, it's what they're used to seeing on the board. And that gives them that link to you. It's just so much more of a link for engagement if you can have them see as it's writing because if your students are confused, they can pause the video and they can say, oh, let me just back that up there and start it again. If it's a PowerPoint that's coming up line by line instead of chronologically the way that you're doing it on the board, it might be a little bit harder for them to follow which piece comes first, second, and third. So for the chronology piece, writing on the screen is, is extremely important, whether you're doing it for flipped classroom, where you're teaching them something in a snippet for them to watch before they come to class, or whether you are doing a hybrid learning or a virtual remote learning, it is just so much more important for them to see the writing on the screen as opposed to the typing that comes up from PowerPoint or Google Slides or whatever program that you're using there. By using the pen, you can also do something besides if you're using a like a Word document or something that you're presenting, you know, you could certainly go in and highlight the text in Word or in a PDF or something like that. But if you can also emphasize by pointing or circling or writing something, oh, look what I was doing here. Um, oh, maybe I made a mistake. You can go and you can, you can cross it out and rewrite it or erase it or highlight it or something like that, which is just a lot more useful and you get a lot more benefit on the student's end because of the fact that this is so much more like what they're used to with writing on the board while you're speaking. Another place that I've used this is in a video um, for a summer assignment or a review of my Vesper chart. You're able to write on the screen and highlight and point out things. I use this particular video to show how the Vesper chart that the students have to memorize for AP Chem to what it looks like in the dot diagram to what it looks like in the artist rendering. And then I can also in my video have a model that I'm showing them. Okay, this is linear. The center molecule is here. Oh, look, this is a 180 degree view. This is a 180 degree angle. So I would also have a model kit um, here that I can hold up on the screen while they're watching or perhaps I would have them make the model at home and be manipulating it in their hands while watching this video if they're not able to be using that model kit because we're not allowed to share supplies because of the restrictions as we go back to school for health reasons. Something else that I wanted to talk to you about is how I do my Google Classroom and how I organize it. So this video is here for backup in case I can't get to that with you. Um, but if you look, when I open up to my Google Classroom and when you go in here, you're just going to go to, if you actually Google, Google Classroom, you'll get here. Now, when I first started using Google Classroom, I had a heart attack because when I went to Google Classroom, this center here was empty. And it took me a few tries to realize that because I have oops, so many different Google accounts on my laptop that are saved here, between my kids have their own home account saved here and my, my school account and everything else, that sometimes my files are saved or available in a different Google account. So make sure if this is empty and you've set something up or if you're just starting, just make sure that you are signed in to your school account. If you're not signed into your school account, 
then your students may not be able to join because of restrictions that are set on the school accounts. Um, and you do just wanna make sure that you link those Google accounts there. That also goes for Google Documents, that goes for Google Slides, that goes for Google Drive. Always just check and make sure you're signed into the correct identity. So the way that I have my Google account set up, I'm just gonna change my color here, I like blue better. Um, I do have a Google Classroom for each different class period. I don't know my class periods yet, so you'll see I just have them labeled A and B. But I also have a combined class. And what my plan is, which is what I did in the spring, if we do wind up going full virtual again, full remote learning, all my students will join the combined class so that I can post everything one time. When school is working on a regular in-person schedule or a hybrid schedule, I will have the students in two separate classes, okay? So I will have them in two separate classes for the start of school, but if something happens that we go full virtual again, then I will put them into my combined classes. You'll see I have combined classes for my chem age also. So, when I go into one of my Google Classrooms, so if I chose the right one, you'll see I do have a bunch of stuff in my stream. I try very hard to post my material before the students join because as soon as you post something in Google Classroom and make it a live um, announcement, live material, live assignment, live quiz, everything will give them a notification at exactly the time that you hit that button. So you hit post, they get a notification. So if you are working at 3 a.m., you might have some unhappy parents and students. So I try to post everything before I have my students join since I did just copy this from my year before. If you are setting this up for the first time, then please make sure that you are posting at a regular time. Oops. You will not get a notification, are you sure you wanna post this, it's a crazy time. Okay, you will not get any kind of notification like that. So please make sure that you post at a regular time. I post everything in classwork because whatever you post in classwork lives in both the classwork section and the stream section. If you only post in the stream, it stays only in the stream. But if you post in classwork and uh, if you post in classwork, it shows up in both places. I set up my Google Classroom by topic. Now, normally, if this was a regular end to last school year, this would be called summer assignment. It's not called summer assignment because it's my, uh, we didn't have a summer assignment because we didn't have the kids back in June um, to give it to them. So for me, I'm just calling this first week lessons. Um, and I'm just assigning that as my first assignment when we get back. But this topic is my double zero and then zero stays at the top, which is odds and ends. And then when I start chapter one, two, and three, I can tap on this and grab the whole topic and just move it up to the top. So I will move whatever the current topic is up to the top. And again, the way that I do that, I click on it and I keep the mouse clicked down so that I drag it. Okay, and you'll see it comes up and I didn't mean to just right click there. Um, but so now it moved up because I dragged it. Another thing that you can do is over on the right hand side, um, I can't get there because of these guys. I'm just gonna move these. If you click here, you can move it up or move it down. So that's another thing that you can do. But again, I always arrange my Google Classroom by topic with the newest current topic on the top. I try to post as much information as material as possible. Okay, so what I post as material I post in each chapter and I try to make it live at the beginning of the year for our global learners, the students that need to see everything and where we're going next. That's really important for that to be all set up there. If you're just working on it and you're just setting up, 
Don't be overwhelmed. Just try to put up material before you get started with the chapter or as soon as you can when you get started with the chapter so that those students that need the big picture can see all of that. Now, um, some of the things that I post as material, I post solutions guides and PowerPoint files and a study guide for each chapter. This is all material that I got from my textbook company and because I'm sharing it only with my group of students, that's permissible um, to do that here. So that's enough about Google Classroom. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk to you about is Flipgrid. And I've used Flipgrid in a bunch of different ways. Um, one of the ways that I used Flipgrid was to stay connected with my students. And you'll see this goofy picture that's kind of that's hidden um, here. Okay, this little goofy picture is a picture of maybe an idea of a way for you to connect with your students um, by having like a question of the week, okay, or a question of the day. And one of the things that I decided that maybe I would do is ask them about their pet. I got a lot of these ideas from my son's fourth grade teacher at the time. Shout out to uh, his fourth grade teacher there. Um, because she was trying to keep that connection with the students, asking them about their pets, asking them about what they miss the most at school. And my son would have that topic. And then the week later, the couple of days later, I'd be like, oh, that's a good topic. I'm going to ask my students. Because one of the things that we're tasked with in hybrid learning or in any sort of remote learning is making personal connections. And we want to connect with our students. We want those nonverbal cues. We want to see how well they're doing at home. We want to know, we want to be able to assess their well being just as well as we want to be able to assess their connection with the current topic that we're working on. And one of the ways that I was able to connect with my students' well being was through Flipgrid. If a student did not respond with their face on camera, I knew that maybe they were having a little bit of an issue or if they didn't want to respond, a lot of my students would respond with their face, but they would put an emoji in front of their face. Um, but you know, it was able, I was able to connect and see if they looked the way that they had when they were at school. And I was able to get some of those nonverbal cues that we get when they're in the classroom, like body language and the way they're carrying themselves and the whether or not they're, um, you know, even something like the way that their hair is done or what they're wearing, we can sort of see some of those well being issues that we do look for as teachers. But we can also talk about some of the things that maybe we would talk about on the way in and out of the classroom. Oh, you just got a new puppy. That's great. Let's have a conversation about that because we all know that teaching is not just about chemistry. I teach chemistry, but I also teach children. And I want to make sure that I'm, I'm more than just that that vehicle to learning and assignment. Anybody can do that. But what we wanna do is really connect with our students at the same time. So that was just one thing that I did. And you can see there's the little video of me. Of me. I don't have pets, I have plants. So um, instead of on the plant one, instead of saying, hey, I'm sorry, on the pet one, instead of saying, hey, here's a picture of my dog or meet my cat or meet my fish, um, perhaps I would share my succulent plant collection because of the fact that I don't actually have any pets. Now, besides the um, connection on a personal level with our students, a lot of us are worried or concerned about how are we going to assess our students while they are at home with Google. Because as we know, as my 11th grade chemistry teacher, Mr. Dixon, told me, as my, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm writing on my screen there. Um, on my face there. As my 11th grade chemistry teacher told me when I first was inspired to teach chemistry, anything without an explanation is worth nothing. And in class, we would have to say, he would say, any answer without an explanation is worth, and we would have to go zilch, zero, zip, and nada, and there were more other words that go with it. Um, and what we wanna do, especially also in this push for, towards NGSS and making our students be able to explain the science phenomena around them, we want to make sure that they can explain their answers. And one thing that I plan to use is Flipgrid, and we can have our students take their test and then assign each student a random number and say, okay, Tom, you now have to explain question number 25, point your camera on your paper, 
and show me your work and show me what, how did you, how did you come to that answer? And if we know, if our students know that they will have to randomly explain an answer on Flipgrid, we get two things out of that. They'll actually make sure that they can explain it. So even if they're sharing answers on the assessment, the point is for them to be able to understand and explain it. So even if they game the system that way, we still make sure that they make sure that they know how to explain it. And number two is we can assess. We can assess another one of those things that we would normally see during class, which is, can our students explain it back to us? Have we done our job? Have we gotten the point across to them so that they feel comfortable then explaining it back to us? And you can make your Flipgrids private Okay, so you can make the settings that only the teacher can view those flip grids. Um, the only the other part of that is that another thing if we want our students to be able to explain the science that happens around them. We can also ask them to do hey, you know what, go in your yard and find something that applies to my class today environmental science teacher. Okay, go find litter and videotape the litter and tell us what you think we can do to prevent this kind of litter. I'm a chemistry teacher. Do you have a pool or access to a pool or or a pond or something like that go out and go and test your pool or go with a friend and go and test their pool and tell me what it means that the ph is low there's a video i plan to make my ph is low because it was raining i can link that to the acid rain issues that we have um, you know go and cook something when you're cooking dinner tonight take a video and explain to me the different changes that you see happening in that food or nutrition biology explain to me why this meal or how this meal gives you the fuel from the different organic um, organic nutrient categories, something like that. So you can certainly use Flipgrid. Flipgrid is so powerful in so many ways. Um, in a non-science way, I know my daughter last year had to try out for the middle school play using Flipgrid. So it was set to teacher only um, you know, for viewing, but she had to record herself singing her song so that she could try out for the musical. And Flipgrid is just amazingly powerful, um, you know, if you think outside the box there and try to come up with some other ways. Um, the last piece that I'm going to present here to talk to you about is Cami. And if I can just go back here again and find my Cami. Cami is a, so a, an app that you can use to annotate PDFs and you can open them in Cami and the students get drawing tools similar um, you know, to what I have here for ink to go. Um, students are able, students and teachers alike are able to write on PDF documents with Cami. And um, it's just uh, camiapp.com. And you can see it up here. Um, I am no longer able to use Cami the way that I used it last year because of the fact that the free Google Classroom integration was only for the spring for teachers. So now that is a paid feature, but there are workarounds. And if you go on YouTube, even on the Cami website, they do have help for using the free version of Cami with your students. My, I learned this one from my daughter's um, seventh grade math teacher last year, and they have one-to-one um, -one touchscreen Chromebooks. And so all of their math homework was done through Cami so that they could actually write on screen using their touchscreen Chromebook. You can use Cami if you have any sort of touchscreen with an iPad or any sort of writing tablet. And I would um, suggest using the Cami app to um, grade papers or to make the um, answer key. So if you look on here on screen, this is just a quick video grab of me screen recording, writing on an answer key using Cami. Um, and the other application, if you're writing in Cami, you know, you could grade it and be like, okay, minus five, show your work. And it's just as easy to write in Cami as it is to write on a piece of paper if you're using a drawing app. The Wacom tablet makes it super easy to do that. Um, and so this way, if you want to grade your papers, grade your tests, the students can take a picture of their work and hand it in to you. And then you can open the PDF in Cami and then just write directly on there. And then the last piece, and I believe this is where someone else puts this video up, is how I do make my videos using the Wacom tablet.
Hi, my name is Beth Tumanello. I'm a chemistry and AP chemistry teacher from Long Island, New York. I've been using a Wacom Intuos tablet for my teaching for the past four years, and I'd like to show you how easy it is to use. The first thing I'd like to show you is what my desk setup looks like. You can see that the Wacom Intuos doesn't take up that much space, and I usually have my laptop and my Wacom Intuos on my desk and a notebook for some notes. So I've brought us to the Wacom webpage and I've actually clicked on the products. Um, and when you click on the products, um, there are different levels of things here. Where I want you to focus on is the Wacom Intuos. That's the one that's most similar to the one that I use. Actually, mine is just an older version of the Wacom Intuos. So if you look here, you can find out about all the different features. There's some videos and some information. There is a Bluetooth version. Um, I believe there's also a Bluetooth adapter. I prefer just to do it USB and keep it simple. Um, but there's lots of information on this page here. And the next place we're going to go is we're going to look at the Ink2Go page to see where you can get the software that I use. Hi, um, so here we are on the Ink2Go website, which is ink2go.org. And what you can see is that there is a place to download the Mac version. There's also a place to download the Windows version. And there is a 15 day free trial. And where we are now is in PowerPoint, which is where I generally do my lectures with my Wacom and the pen tools. I can either use the pen tools from PowerPoint or I can use the pen tools from Ink2Go to explain the complicated problem on the screen instead of just advancing or highlighting or circling as the PowerPoint typing goes up. My students have told me that they very much prefer seeing the handwriting as opposed to seeing a typed PowerPoint. This allows them to see the process step by step, and there's a little bit more of a connection because of the fact that it is very similar to the way that I would be teaching them on the board in classroom. The other alternative in PowerPoint would be to have the typing come up on the screen and my students have told me all the time that they very much prefer seeing the writing on the screen to that. Beth, that's great. Thank you so much. We have, we have a few quick questions up and, and, uh, and the ones we can't get to, we will get answers, answers out. Uh, one question was, have you ever used your Wacom technology uh, with, a, with an LCD uh, projector in your classroom? We, you just need to come off mute, Beth, and then we can hear your answer. Unmute. I'm off, I'm off. There you okay. go. Okay. Um, I have, um, I have not used the Wacom tablet with an LCD screen. Is that, well, I, is that what the question was? Yes. Yes. Okay. I have not. I have primarily used it with my own laptop to make the videos, um, but I have also used it, um, you know, on different computers and things like that, but I haven't used it up on an LCD screen. Right. So if you're projecting from your project with your projector connected to your laptop screen, it should, it, my, my assumption is it works just fine, but I'm going to also ask our, the rest of our Wacom tech team to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, I would imagine that it does because yeah. as long as you can connect it to your computer, it, you are writing it, on whatever is being projected yeah. from the computer. So I, right. I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, exactly. Um, the other, uh, we have a question about, um, about Cami, and I know you are using a free version, um, and Cami has different license, license levels, so we would urge, urge folks to take a look at what's available from Cami. Beth, in just a, a minute or two left before we hand it off to Charles, um, when you find an app that you want to use, 
I am assuming you're talking either to your building's technology director or your district's technology director. And 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 what advice can you give to our folks on the on the on the webinar today about you you know, do their schools already have some of these apps available from other departments, for example? I was gonna say, we have, um, I know in my district, the way that I would do it, I would speak to my department supervisor, my department chairperson, and then they would handle, um, you know, moving up the chain and finding out who to speak to. Um, but we do have an, um, a, an enormous amount of software and apps available. We just don't always know what's available if we haven't used it. And I know in my particular district, we have tech mentors. And so the tech mentors, you know, you can kind of shoot out an email to them and say, hey, what's available? Is this available? And that would be a member of the teaching staff who you would reach out to and say, do we have this? And if we don't, how do we find out how to move forward? So I would say the advice that I would give is speak to your direct supervisor, whether it's your chairperson or your department supervisor or assistant principal, whatever, however it works in your building. And usually they can point you in the right direction. And if enough people feel it's valuable and will use it, a lot of times if it's useful and will help the students if it's in the budget, um, you know, I know in my experience, I've been able to say, hey, you know, we don't use this, but we want this and maybe some, maybe there can be a swap out made. Sure. That, I would say speak, speak to the people yeah. in your district and find yeah. out. That's great. We have, we have a quick technical question in. How are you doing the screen split when you're showing your face and either uh, chemical formulas, et cetera? On the, on the one of the sample videos or mm -hmm. in yeah. Ink2Go, Ink2Go has yeah. a part of its toolbar um, where if you go to the preferences, it actually has a webcam and as an option. And I know that Loom also does, Screencastify, IPVO, all of those different apps have an option where you can pin a uh, talking head, you know, somewhere on the screen. And right. I know in Ink2Go yeah. in particular, it allows me to decide the size of the, of the, of the screen for the, the um, resolution, how well do I want it to be, you know, how many pixels do I want it to take up. And um, I have played around a little bit with Loom, which is free for educators. Um, if you sign up on their website, it's Loom, like L-O-O-M. That's another one that allows you to have the talking head. And you can turn that on and off. And yes. some people do say that having that connection with you speaking allows the students to connect more with the video. It's, it's powerful. And you're going to love this question. Um, and the ones we didn't get to, we will get answers out to you. But where did you get the periodic table behind you? I meant Somebody to discuss to this before. I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot. Um, so I read a lot of things that said that the virtual backgrounds in Zoom and Google Meet can be distracting because when you move, sometimes it gets pixelated behind you and you get that sort of that strange depth happening behind you. This is from Amazon. And um, it's it really, I just Googled, uh, I just searched on Amazon periodic table shower curtain. And it's just um, a shower curtain with regular shower hooks hanging on a clothing rack. That's so awesome. one of those clothing racks on wheels and I can put it behind me and you have no idea. I could have sacks of laundry behind me or you know, um, groceries or a mess. And it's just very, you know, very, very professional. I can put this anywhere. I can, I can roll it through my, throughout my house, wherever that, I want to present. That's from. terrific. Beth, we can't thank you enough. Folks, uh, the Beth's PowerPoint deck will be available. And at the end of the deck, there's also a list of the resources that she uses. And if we can just go back to the deck now, I want to turn this over to Charles so, so he, can, he can wrap up and take us out. Charles, it's all yours. Thanks, Linda. And thank you very much, Beth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for attending our Wacom Educator Series, uh, focused primarily on science. Uh, Beth, again, really great content. Super appreciate your enthusiasm for Wacom products, and, and we're glad we could uh, help you out with uh, the education needs during these tough times. Um, just wanted to point out, uh, you know, the product that Beth was using was called the Wacom Intuos. Um, it, we have a, a lot of models. Uh, they start at uh, $79.95. Um, probably the most convenient place to pick them up is at Best Buy for most people. Um, I saw there was at least one Canadian uh, resident on the call, so uh, you can also pick it up at Best Buy Canada. 
Um, we also have a newer product if you're looking for something uh, where you can actually draw on screen. Uh, it's called the Wacom One. Uh, really fantastic product, can be used as a separate monitor. Um, great, great um, piece of, of, of hardware. Uh, in Give you, gives you a really natural experience of drawing on screen, compatible with Mac, PC, and in fact, um, some Android devices if, if you have a Samsung. Um, very cool to check out. Uh, both can be used with all of the software that Beth mentioned today on, on the call. Um, added some links in the chat. If you're interested in picking up the Wacom One, uh, you can definitely get uh, know some great deals in the chat uh, there's a couple of links so one for Canada and then another one for um, a, a store called B&H which is a great partner for ours and speaking of B&H um, they also do have an educator uh, discount program uh, you can you can get them I'll put it in the chat here for everyone uh, and you can get five percent off if you sign up uh, any Wacom products. Currently we are uh, dealing with some inventory issues just due to the demand of our products. Uh, so sometimes with B&H, some of the smaller retailers, uh, they might not have products available, but please check them out. Um, as an educator, again, you can sign up and get 5% off. So um, again, these are <laughs> any deals for us in England. Um, not in England, but uh, they, you can definitely purchase uh, uh, Wacom products in England. I don't have anything, uh, any links right now, but uh, available through Amazon, obviously, or any of, of, of those places as well. So uh, again, thank you all very much for, for attending. Um, <laughs> you're, you're welcome, Katie. Um, and then also we will be doing a, a second uh, webinar with Beth on the 23rd on, on this Monday. So you know, keep an eye on your Facebook feeds or Instagram feeds, which I'm sure most of you came through. Uh, for signups and information on that. Um, yeah, Linda and Beth, did you have any closing remarks? The other one is on the 24th, I believe. Oh, the 24th, excuse me. 24th. 24th. But sorry, it is still sorry. The Monday, still Monday, Monday the 24th. Yes. That, yes. Everyone, please take Sunday off. As yeah. you just asked me that, I was about to type that in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, wanna... Monday the 24th. I want to thank you all so, so much for joining us. And please take a look at the Never Stop Learning site, the community site on Wacom. There's lots of great resources, webinars, articles, all kinds of things. Um, and I think it, this all just reflects Wacom's commitment to really uh, serving and supporting K-12 educators. So thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.